And so welcome everyone who's watching at home. This is a live Q&A for The Last Tree. Um, I am Bean Manzini and I'm going to be hosting it today. I'm a poet, I'm a writer. I also head up Caramel Film Club and we spotlight film with black talent. So it's a privilege and a pleasure to be working on this film with these, these wonderful talents. Some of you may have been expecting Mia Bayes. Unfortunately, she's not able to join us today, but we are the Fantastic Four. So we're gonna have a great time anyway. Um, I'd like to thank Picture House Live and Picture House Entertainment for organizing this event. Thank you to BFI Player, subscribers can see the film there. It's also available to buy on DVD, DVD Blu-ray, iTunes and Amazon. So for those of you who may have seen the film or not, I'm gonna just give a little bit of a description. So this is the second feature by the incredibly talented young director, Shola Amu in 2019, following his debut film, A Moving Image, which was made on a micro budget back in 2016, along with a number of acclaimed shorts. The Last Tree tells the story of Femi, first seen as a young boy living in the idyllic countryside with his foster mother before he's transported to London. And the film moves forward and we see Femi in his adolescence and quite troubled life. It's a touching, beautifully shot film, personal story on a cinematic scale. And it was released in cinemas at the end of last year with Picture House Entertainment and the reviews were exceptionally strong. So I'm gonna introduce Shola Amu, writer, director, Samuel Adewumi, who plays the lead as Femi, and Ruth Bellina, who plays Tope. And um, thank you so much guys for being here. It's really great to see you and it's great to talk to you earlier. Um, on that note, I'm gonna start up with some fun warm up questions. So when we were talking earlier, Shola, you were saying that your cooking skills have oh. gone chef high oh. <laughs> in lockdown. <laughs> but we know we're missing the eldest cooking for us. So I just wanted to yeah. ask you what you're craving the most. Is it a jello rice dish? Is it pounded yam or is it fufu? <laughs> Which of the three? Uh, it's always it's always the same for me. It's always uh, Eba and Awedi. That's my that's my go to. Oh Eba. right. Yeah. So yeah, my mom knows when when I'm home, that's what's going down. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so it's the Eba. Interest. Okay, I'm with you. I'm pounded jam and the goosey personally, but yeah, I, I get it. Honorary Nigerian. <laughs> so I'm going to come to you. We were talking about your wonderful year of return and you hit Ghana and South Africa and Nigeria as well. If you could get on a plane tomorrow, which of those three would you go to? Well, I'd be in a homeland. I would go, I'd go straight back to Nigeria. Um, yeah, connect with my family, hit up Lagos, maybe maybe see VI again. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd, it would definitely be, definitely be Nigeria. All right, nice. I'm yet to go, I look forward to it. And, you have a good time. Yeah. And Ruth, you can either pick one of those two questions or I can give you a wild card. Which would you prefer? I'll take a wild card. Okay. Okay. Yeah. One brave, of the brave, brave. Brave. Oh. One of the great things about seeing you and your beautiful talent on screen is it's still quite rare to see brown skin women as leading ladies. So I've been thinking about some of the stuff that I've been watching. So out of the three, this is a tough choice. Michaela Ooh. Cole, Issa Rae, Lupita Thiongo. Ah, you <laughs> shaked it. Okay. Should I'm gonna have to go with Lupita. I'm gonna have to go with Lupita. Okay. Anyway, this, I'm not gonna lie, but I'm gonna go into pizza. Okay, nice. Yeah. All right, guys. So we are gonna get into the meat and potatoes, if you like, of the event. And so for those of you watching at home, if you're watching on YouTube, you can put your comments on the right hand side of the screen. Those questions will be fed to me, and then I'll I'll ask it to um, our wonderful guests. Um, I'm going to get straight into the genesis of the project with you, Shola. Um, I'm really interested in two things. Um, the fact that the inception of this in terms of the script development was 2014 
and then it was released in 2019. But in between, you had a Rubin image release in 2016. So tell us about that timeline and the process of juggling a number of projects and also how you navigated the biographical detail. Yeah, sure. Um, I'll, I'll start with the latter first. So it's last three semi-autobiographical. So I've used certain elements from my life and for instance, I was fostered. Um, but I also then interviewed uh, a group of British Nigerians who were also fostered and, and got their stories. And essentially what's happened is like a fusing of both our narratives. It was like a coalescence into something new. And, and that's how I approached the story um, in that kind of vein. And, and then the development process, which was, um, as development often is quite long, um, I was developing the last three and a moving image simultaneously. Um, I think a lot of film, filmmakers are obviously aware of doing, working on multiple projects at a time. Um, and so development on the last tree paused for a minute. And so I went full steam ahead with um, a moving image. And um, making that first was really amazing because it's, you know, it's a multimedia film about um, gentrification in Brixton. And uh, you know, I started off in documentary um, and a moving image is like part documentary, part fiction, a bit of animation, some performance art and photography. So it was a real uh, sort of kind of arty based project. And I got to experiment and try out so many fun things. And so by the time development kicked up again on the last tree, um, I had a pretty firm aesthetic and way of wanting to handle it. And I think that really fed into the kind of visual language of the last tree. Yeah, nice. Um, and tell us about the um, influences you had. I mean, there's a clear reference to Spike Lee. What about any other influences in the coming of age cinema? Uh, cinema uh, references for me, usually uh, there's only a couple of people that I really like Jack of the Yard, I'm a big fan of A Prophet. I thought that is an important film. And uh, Kubrick is a really big influence. And 2001 is probably my favorite film. 2001 Space Odyssey. And then some early Spike Lee for sure, like Do the Right Thing, uh, super influential. Mm. And so this film is very much still a rarity. Talk to us about your vision to have a film like this on the big sale and have a cinematic release. I know today um, it's going to the US, so woo, woo, woo for that. Hey. Um, <laughs> was that always your goal and your vision in terms of, of this particular project? Yeah, I think it, I always love movies with a sense of scale, even if um, the story is, 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 a, is coming from... Uh, niche or small perspective. I think that it's such an intimate little film in a sense, but it's done on such a massive scale. And I think that, you know, when you find such a specific story like The Last Tree, there's no reason why you can't infuse it with all of the kind of uh, bravado of, of, of big scale cinema. And that's how I approached The Last Tree. Um, the, film, you know, the film I mentioned is a reference that is literally a world away from the last three years, 2001 Space Odyssey and, and this work that Kubrick does. And I always enjoyed the sense of uh, epicness and scale that he had in these movies. And so I, I like the idea of, of having a film that's centered around, you know, black characters that have that, that, that level of scale. Mm. And you talked about, you know, black characters and 90% of the cast were black in this film. And I know that behind the scenes, it was it was parallel, um, which is a good segue into um, the editing and the music choices and how you work with those other creatives. Can you tell us a little bit about that? And um, yeah, music is such a crucial role in, in this film. Yeah, because, you know, I always joke with my friends that, I'm um, essentially a failed musician who makes films. So <laughs> music become, music is super important to me. Uh, like really, uh, I can't even really chart my identity before music sometimes because it, it's, it feels such an integral part. So um, I have collaborated on my projects with the same guys really. I'm Demiri and Kemi, the editor, Shaggy Nakanola, the composer, and Still Williams, the DP. So the last three for all, 
all four of us essentially is like our third collaboration. So there's already a coalescence of styles and energy. And so when thinking about music, you know, I knew Shagan would um, infuse the, the picture with such a fascinating and experimental score. You know, Shagan is also the composer for Doctor Who. So I think, you know, um, it was at, at one point it was touch and go whether we'd get him back because he was making so much Doctor Who money uh, <laughs> to watch, <laughs> to work on this independent film. Uh, but he said, you know what, Joe, I'll stop, I'll stop the, the Doctor Who checks for two minutes. Let me come, let me come make the score with you. Uh, no, no, so, so it was good to get him, it was good to get him back and me and him always have a good time talking about music and, and the score. And that to me is such a fun process. Um, because it, you know, it's it's really, it's like you know the icing on the, on the cake. So it's really, um, it's really important and integral to me um, in cinema. And I've always liked directors who know how to use music well, and not everyone does. Hmm. So we've just had a question from Twitter, Jamie Morris. Um, one of the things that unites Femi and Tope in this film is their taste in music. So I'm going to ask this question to Ruth and Sam. Um, what albums and artists did each of you listen to growing up? Sam, go first. Uh, hey, B. Um, what albums was I listening to growing up? I mean, I didn't really have, I'm like the first grandchild in my family, so I'm like the oldest, like, the oldest young person, the oldest offspring in my family, kind of. So um, I was just what, listening to a lot of pop music, to be honest with you, um, or whatever it was that my mum was listening to. So I probably can't remember the name of the album, but like someone that really sticks in my mind growing up is um, Sunny Ade. Um, yeah. We listened to a lot of him growing up, um, a lot of Fela, Fela Kuti growing up, um, a lot of Lagbaja as well. So. Um, yeah, a lot of Nigerian artists, um, as well as mixing with a bit of Britney Spears and, <laughs> you know, uh, take that and all. <laughs> that never, never take that, never that, never that. Uh, never that. That's what was on top of the pops, you know. My man could have said E17, he said, at least. It's good to have <laughs> S Club Seven. S Club Seven was another big, big band. You know it, Rusha. Yes, yes I did. I watched the show. Yeah. Shame, yeah. yeah, just a lot of Nigerian artists and like just pop music, I guess. That's a great mix. I love it. And what about you, Ruth? Uh, for me, it was okay. My first album, my first musical love was Michael Jackson. I know it's probably for a lot of people say so it was started off there. Um, apart from that, it was like literally gospel music because you spend most of the time in church with your auntie's house. And then like, I'm from Congo. So music literally runs through that country. And it's like, Congo people say music runs through our blood and through our hips. So like, the Kofi Olomi Days and Where Her Sons, those are the artists from like my culture and hearing that and hearing the aunties and sisters and so on dancing around us. Apart from that, what I fell in love with personally myself was started off with hip hop. So it's like the Wu Tang. So I was 94 in it, 94 baby. All of those things, listening to my older cousins and brothers listening to those albums. But yeah, and then hip hop definitely. And so I was there with all the pop stars. But yeah. Yeah, no, you started making me miss partying so much and so much. Um, talk to us a little bit, Sam and Ruth, um, about working with Shola and other members of the cast, but also your casting process. So how did you get involved in the film and what was it like to read the script for the first time? Uh, Ruth, do you want to go first? No, you can. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, I'll, I'll, I guess I'll work backwards working from the script. Uh, I remember when I first got it. Um, it was a, it was like a, there was a self tape sort of audition thing. Um, and then uh, a year had passed after I'd done that. And uh, Shola, Shola tells me it's because they were still securing funding. I feel like he was just trying to, I feel like he was just trying to make up his mind. I feel like he wasn't sure to be honest, but like, yeah. So it was like a year and then there was um, another self tape and then I got to come in and then I got to read the full script as well. And uh, just, my first reaction was I loved it. Um, and I was I was really excited. Um, whether or not the role came to me, I was just excited by the fact that this is like 
it's a story that I knew I hadn't seen before. It's a story that I could connect with. It's a story I felt like many others would be able to connect with. Um, and it's like a black British story um, that's, it was just told from a perspective that we don't often, we don't often get the, uh, the privilege of, um, of seeing. So yeah, my first reaction was excitement. And then, um, and then I got the role and I was really, really lucky to, and um, I got to work with, you know, people like Rushai and Remy and, you know, uh, Remy Camello, Nicholas Pinnock. Um, and uh, yeah, it was um, Denise Black. Like it was just, it was an incredible experience to be honest. Um, it was a lot of fun. Um, yeah, it was, I mean, I don't really know what else to say. I think that, you know, the people that I worked with, the cast, the crew, everyone was just amazing. Um, and there was this real sort of uh, familiar feeling working with everyone, even though I hadn't met a lot of them before. Uh, there was just this vibe. It was like, we're a family, you know, we're in this to, we're in this because we're really passionate about the story and we all feel very similarly about the characters and, you know, and we're led by, you know, this, charismatic zen like director you know that just is able to, is that able, you know, just able to get on with everyone you know what i mean so the vibe working was every day was like a was a blessing and it was a joy and that's not always that's not always the case when you're working so um yeah i, I just felt really really lucky to to be working working on it and you know to be working with talented people again like everyone i don't want to pick anyone out but like to be working with, with all those talented people um and even like the day players as well, you know, we all just, we all just yeah. on and there was just this feel of, we're all just really happy to be involved in making this film. So yeah, felt very privileged. Ruth, I heard you agreeing. What was your take yeah, on sorry, I'm such a mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm <laughs> person. <laughs> but yeah, everything he basically, that Sam was going on to follow up off, it was, um, well, I'll, you know, I'll start from the top and the way down. Um, same way it was self-tape first, I, you know, when I read the script, because I always say with um, Topay's character, I feel like it does scream to a lot of young black girls, especially for me being a dark skinned girl and growing up in <laughs> London and <laughs> in, in the world of how, you know, children are. So when I started reading, I was like, oh my gosh, I've never seen this on TV. I mean, me, I'm one of the people that I was Americanized from a young age because I only saw myself in American shows, American movies. I mean, I lived in blockbuster. <laughs> so when I read the script, I related to Tope. I understood and I was like, yeah, I'm so, I was excited for the story to be told whether I was involved or not from the mm-hmm. beginning. Then it was the meeting Sam in the audition room and doing the read with him. And I remember walking out thinking, I'm not gonna get this. Like, I'm just not gonna, and we did the improv and I, it's been so long since I'd improv or been in any, probably first from drama school and then doing like one job that was in the theater and then this is my first like TV audition I was like no nah, they're gonna look at me and see amateur straight away but then as I walked out and then getting the call back and getting told oh we would like to work with you I think from then I felt a sense of almost responsibility to play this part I don't know I always said that like, if I ever did a part or TV or film or whatever it would be something that would speak to the little me and it almost me being a spiritual kind of person I was like it happened for a reason um, then working with people, meeting Shola, talking to him. And he, we had this initial meeting where we went to the um, costume studio to try and our fit. And then Shola had this thing where he called us out, had a little chat to us about the characters. And I remember sitting there kind of obviously a bit nervous thinking, all right, just listen to what the director says, just kind of go along with it. But then he left it open and was asking questions. And I felt that freedom to work, mm-hmm. like to actually work and like, pick through it, because that's what I love doing with characters and picking through it and figuring out why and so on. And Shola was open f- to do that. And then I meet Sam and he's open to work and I meet the rest of the crew and everyone's, it's just that family atmosphere and being comfortable to be able to put your work out there because it is sensitive work sometimes. And when you tap into, sorry about that, tap into certain parts of the character or certain lines, there's the risk of you letting yourself go to the point where you've let too much of yourself out. And I was happy that I was made comfortable to do that with the cast and crew of a selection who should have picked the people then I don't know but you know did a good job because it was which is a good film that love for the project you felt that everywhere you went from the lighting to the sound to the continuity everyone was speaking about these people like they were real people because mm-hmm. some of us maybe knew them or some of us were them so yeah I'm gonna ramble on so I'll keep it as that <laughs> <Did I? laughs> 
no, I love it. I mean, we're all smiling because it's, it's joyful to hear that you had that experience. And I guess, you know, I'm struck by your humbleness as well, because, you know, you've won awards of the of the back of your work. So talk well, to us about that. Best performing <laughs> actress, Biffer, and that. My like, <laughs> my like. Oh, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Which is the last time I saw all you guys together. So, yeah, and I'll, mm. Sam, I'll come to you about your um, awards and accolades as well. But Ruth, talk to us about that and that experience. <laughs> you know... I still laugh to this day because, come on, man, who would have guessed it? Like, I honestly did not see that coming. So me hearing that the nomination was even an option was, oh, okay, maybe they'd be nice to me. Do you know what I mean? I feel like I had that constant thought of maybe it's just a nice thing. Maybe the, the project did so well that it was like, oh, let's give, because the woman who played Sam's mom, I honestly loved her performance like for me if I could have like it wasn't me which I to this day I feel like I, I understand I got in I want to I'm grateful but if I could push that on somebody else that's who I would have given it to you know what I mean so then to win nah that one took me off man that took me out I, I to this day I'm very grateful and I'm I've always been <laughs> to the BAFTA awards but I mean to the PIF awards but I don't think I'm gonna sit in it too much because I didn't think this is in my career I'd ever get any type of award, let alone nomination. But I'm grateful. I'm humbled. Good. And what about you, Sam? Um yeah, uh I, I remember when the when the nominations um came out and uh I, I was um I was abroad at the time working and um yeah, like there was just stuff happening in my personal life that was uh, just affecting me, and uh, yeah, and and that came through. And um, I don't know if I should say, it, I don't know if it's professional, but Shola was like keeping me up the whole time before the film came. I'd seen it, he'd been like, "Nah, like you know, we're gonna be trying to do this and that and the other." And I feel like you know, your performance was this, and you know, I feel like you'll get you know these sorts of different situations, and then. I was always just like, oh, you're just saying that because you made the film, right? Like, you're the director. Right? Of course, you want you want to be the before best. Before I was gassing him, before I was gassing him. <laughs> that's, that's, what you, that's what you were doing, bro. You was gassing me big time, innit? And I was just like, you're just saying it because, like, you know, you want your work to be good, you know, naturally. And, and I'm, I'm a, I was appreciative of the words. But I'm, at the end of the day, like, when we're being real, like, it's, uh, I don't know, I don't want to get too political in it, but, like, when we look at all the acting categories, like me and Rusha were like the only like black people nominated, do you know what I mean? And that's not uh, a shot to anyone, do you know what I mean? Everyone was there for their on, on like on their merit. But like seeing that and being amongst the names that I was amongst as well, I just I was humbled and I was grateful, but like I just I don't know, I didn't really think um I don't know, I, I wasn't really sure if anything was gonna come of it, to be honest with you. I was just like, oh well, this is it's nice to get some recognition for the work. It's nice for our film to get this kind of recognition. I know Shaggy Bake and Aisha Bywalt was also got nominated. So it's like, you know, this is this is a good look for everyone involved in the film. Um, and then on the night, even beforehand, people had been like, you should really like write a speech and prepare something. Like, <laughs> no, like if I do that, like, then I'm confirming something. And if, yeah. if it doesn't happen, I just don't want to feel like that disappointment. Do you know what I mean? I just want to go with the flow. And like I'm just grateful to have been nominated, and then, and then they say your name, and then they said my name, and I was just, and it was the first award of the night, and I was just like, mm. I was just like wow, like I was stunned. Charlie was sitting next to me, and I was like looking at him like, bro, what? And he just <laughs> gave me like this big hug, and he embraced me, and um, yeah, I just I tried to find the words on the night, but like, um, yeah, it was it was a it was a surreal experience to be honest. Um, and I'm, I'm, you know, this is like the first sort of major project that I've done where I've had like a major role and uh, for it to culminate with with that, you know, like I thought so us going to Sundance, I thought was incredible, Sundance Utah. And then we got Sundance here in London and we were doing these tours and stuff. And, you know, you just don't think because it's not a massive budget sort of film, you don't think it's really gonna go to the scale that it does. I mean, for me to win, but again, I'm not even gonna, I'm not even gonna gas it. I was so, I don't know what it, what it is, but I was so much happier when I heard Rushai's name get called. Like, because, because there's this, 
you know, I, I don't know, man. I don't know. You just have to look at, you know, she she was in a category with like some really experienced actors. Um, I know. know some really talented, talented actors. And not to say, you know, what, absolutely my category as well, full of really, really talented people. But like, you know, Rusha was a, was, is an actor that's, that was her first opportunity. And, and for it to come up like that, it's just like, I don't know. I just felt very grateful. And in, in the whole thing with the two of us winning those awards, for me, it was just, again, a lot of gratitude to Shola, a lot of gratitude to, uh, to Miff Hopkins and Lee Thomas, our producers, you know, gratitude to the people that chose us for Sundance, P Picture House, like everyone. It was just like, what a great look for every single person involved in this film. Because like, I know what it was like working day to day. You know, if I wasn't working with the people that I was, if I didn't have that joyful experience, there's no, I don't know, you, you, I can't tell the future, but I don't feel like it would have culminated in, in such, like, in such accolades being, being, being collected for us. So yeah, it was, it was, I was happy. I was very happy personally, but like, for me, it was just more like, wow, look at what, look at what teamwork can actually do. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. And Sam, you mentioned Sundance. So I'm going to come to you about Sundance and, um, what was it like getting reactions in the US and responses to that and then coming back to Sundance London? Talk to us about your experience there. It was really exciting. Uh, it's a festival I had played before with, but with a short film. Um, and so it was really exciting to go there with a feature project and to have our world premiere there and have all of just the engagement, the, the press around it. It was really surreal. I mean, we were staying in such a interesting place uh sam and i and, and um Mif and lee um and and it just was it just felt super surreal and i the reception to the film was great and it really was the perfect platform for us we opened up the world fiction competition um and that's really a nice a nice uh slot uh, at the festival and um, and I, I kind of uh, kind of wish for a better scenario. And that's the thing about the last tree, you know. I think as Sam mentioned, not every, you know, film sets can be uh, tumultuous places. And um, I think we can all look back at that time and set at the last tree, and shooting that from Lincolnshire to London to to Lagos, and just look at it and be like, damn, that was fun. You know, it was a, it's an intense story but we had such a pleasant experience. And it was testing and trying as it always is, long days and everyone trying to get the best out of each other. But, you know, I think what I love about the legacy of the film is that, um, you know, everyone's will hold on to that experience. And, and yes, all the accolades and are, are great as well. And I think the lifespan of the film, you know, as we're opening in the US today, um, I think each year, we'll look back at that or well the year we shot and the year of the release with fonder and fonder memories and i think it's something that we can all take on to our next whatever situations we're getting on in, into next you know because again as sam said it's not always the way that type of environment mm, yeah for sure so um, i want to ask you guys some of the questions that we're getting in they're coming in fast and furious um so Paul asks, like to know a little bit more about why the film is called The Last Tree and how <laughs> this might connect to films. Big theme of roots and displacement. You probably had this question a few times. This is, my, this is my favorite question. It's my favorite question because uh, it's the most frequently asked one and I, and I love it. I think because the, the title is so ambiguous. Um, but I think for, for me, it was always the concept of the family tree and having roots being connected to your lineage and your heritage, which I think Femi, uh, it was the start of the film, lacks and develops through the course of the film. So that's really the meaning for me. Mm, thank you. Um, and Rebecca Irvin asks, um, I'll give this one to you, Sam. What was the aspect of Femi's character that felt most important to convey to the audience and why? Um... For me, it was the uh, the idea, and maybe a theme as well, uh, of wearing like masks and the different type of masks that we wear. Uh, and this is something that Shola and I discussed like before the film. 
uh, before we started shooting. Um, and it's something that I kind of just got from the script. There was, you know, there was this, especially when he got when he got older, there was this idea. He he kind of he kind of had created himself, um, and it was a self that was very different to who his his real you know who who he is at his core and, and who he is in his in his internal, um, and you know in different spaces, um, it was like he was kind of a different person or different spaces would bring out different aspects to himself and would mean that he has to shut off other aspects to himself. So um, yeah, I think the idea of like wearing masks was like the most interesting because it means even if in a moment or in a scene, this is, you know, what's happening on the page is what's happening, what's actually happening for Femi like inside is, is, is a bit different. And so, yeah, that was, yeah, I think that was the most interesting aspect for me. Mm -hmm. And something I'm sure a lot of particularly black males can really, really relate to. Yeah. I think that's something, yeah, I think that's something that's so great about this film. I mean, when I, when I saw it the first time um, at Sundance and I was creating a, a quick fire poetic response to it, um, it was just, it really, it was so poignant and it touched me in so many ways, the way we journey with Benny and all of his challenges. And I watched it more recently and I was really filled with this sense of hope and healing from it and it might be you know the context the time we're living in is quite extraordinary maybe i needed to pull that out but i was curious for all of you um you know you've all seen the film a few times and i wondered if there was any kind of reframing in those uh in those viewings you guys got anything not reframing from the viewing yeah so in in terms of like watching the film again Oh, yeah. and how might have landed slightly differently with a second viewing or a third viewing, yeah. Okay. Go, on, go on, director. I'm going to take that one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, take that, Shudder. <laughs> uh, it's, you know, it's, I think maybe it's, uh, maybe I experienced the film differently because I've seen it so many times in terms of the process of making it. Um, but I'm always... I, I think the thing that always strikes me is while there is a clear edginess to it in, in terms of how it flirts with darkness, I think that there is this overwhelming humanity in it. And I think um, I think that's really really represented by the end in, uh, in Femi's like yell when he's in Lagos. And you feel like, you know, he's really expelling all of his energy in that action and freeing himself. So I think that's um, that's what I get from it. It's such an experiential film, and it, and uh, and sometimes even when watching it, I'm like surprised by the amount of risk taking that was <laughs> that was in it. You know, like like I'm like, oh, like oh, that year really had some balls. Like, <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> like you know, like, like so. But uh, like I hope I hold on to that uh, moving forward because I think in uh, in those moments of risk, we really got to discover some things. Would you two like to speak to that question? Or we can be, move on to another one. I've got loads for you. There's loads here. I mean, <laughs> if we're going to get any better than from the writer director's mouth. So we get, we're, we're not really necessarily that involved in the entire process. Um, yeah. So obviously, we have a script, then we shoot what we shoot, which sometimes isn't necessarily exactly what was on the page. Uh, and then, you know, the director and our amazing editor in, in Infamiri and Kemi then go, uh, go away and, and make, make the story out of what we've shot. So um, I just know from my first view and when I saw it, I was just like, oh, this isn't, this isn't what I thought I would see. Like, you know, it read in a very linear way. And then watching the film, I was just like, wow, this is so different. And, Look at these interesting choices, and I think as well because I'm because you're watching yourself, it's very hard to like detach and just watch the film. Um, but like I think by the third time I'd watched it, I was just able to take it in for like for the art that it was. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So I guess those would be two different things. Like you don't really know, you know, whether what you've shot is always going to be exactly what you thought it was when you were shooting it. Yeah, no, definitely. And Ruth. Um... Yeah, maybe talk to what it was like to see it with like a London audience and 
you know, what is the, perhaps what is the, the nicest or most heartfelt thing someone has said to you about uh, your part in the film? You know, because I wasn't at the original premieres, so I didn't get to see it with everyone and have that first five. So I got that, I was lucky enough to have the, you know, space of just my room and me to sit there and have my screaming moments and my comedy moments on my own. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I think the response is that I've, I want to say loved, but I, it's sat, sat with me and I've just, I've been pleased with and content with was when girls that look like me come and say, oh my gosh, I remember when that was me or when this happened to, you know, when I felt like that, like Tope. And I remember, I think Sam was in the cinema, <laughs> a young lady who sent me a voice note um, and she was just, you know, congratulating me and saying like, it's the same sort of rhetoric. And I was, I was really moved. Like, even though I thought, okay, the, the younger girls might see it to hear that the girls that are maybe my age and older women, women as well say the same thing. I was like, all right, I did this, this, this character justice. I did all the topes, some justice, you know, it was that confirmation to a degree. And that's what I wanted to kind of get from it. Um, yeah, and then when I watched it again, I kind of, yeah, like Sam, I could sit into it a bit more, but at first I was a bit, ah, I love the editing. Cause like I said, I didn't see how he was gonna put certain things together and the, the track of like, just, yeah. The lighting, especially the, oh, the, the drug den scenes as well. I was like, oh, okay, all right, Shona, put some flavor on this. Okay, we're going to make a Okay, what's that film, film? Equilibrium of a um, our song, trippy film that I watched one time. I was like, yeah, Shona's on his director bag, like he's on his visionary bag. So I was like, yeah, I enjoyed watching it. So, yeah. <laughs> and Ruth, another question that has come in, um, Elena has asked, um, did you draw on your own experience to get into character? And what was your process in terms of getting into character? Yeah, I was, um, <laughs> I don't, I'm not a method actor, but at the same time, I love method, that drawing from the, that method realm. Um, it, I didn't want to touch too much on my own experience. I didn't want to get make it a me Thing. I mean, like I said, I want to keep it general for all the topics because I don't know what everyone else has gone through in that sense. Um, but yeah, I did draw on a lot of personal experience. I mean, one thing, I'm black, I'm dark skinned. Um, I grew up in a time when it wasn't the, oh, what's the word? It wasn't the stereotypical look or considered beautiful or even, <laughs> we just about had Naomi Campbell in a, in a magazine, do you know what I mean? Um, so that, feeling of what's the word that used to be run a lot blick blick hearing that blick your blick your blick or other people i've seen other boys or and then seeing yeah all of that was where i drew from it's from that place of not under almost not loving yourself at a young age because you're not seeing yourself you're not hearing the words being said to certain people being said to you and thinking okay something's different about me and then having to understand race through that for a, in a personal journey. Um, yeah, and then growing up in London as well. I mean, like I said, we know these characters, we know the, the school bullies, we know the, the teachers that are trying to encourage you, we know all of these people. And yeah, with Tope, it was drawing from a lot of personal experience, but also adding, talking to friends and cousins, and then even people that aren't, don't, aren't like Tope and asking them what they felt about the Topes in their school. But yeah, that was really... <laughs> I don't know how I to read that sounds, but I just, I just kind of went for what I knew and then tried to talk my people's experiences. Yeah. And Sam, what about you? You answered the same question of your process in terms of getting into character, but I'm also really curious about the fact that, you know, um, Ty played the younger you. So what was your relationship with him? Yeah, shout out Ty. Shout out Ty Golden. Because <laughs> we never actually... Yeah, you know, we never actually got to, like, act together. Um, but he's he's such a um, I don't want to I don't know I don't even know what to say without guessing it but like he's he's just such a cool kid um, and um, a, a real natural natural actor and he's 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 a he comes across a lot older than he is as well um, so in terms of building the character obviously like aside from my work being able to just spend some time with him on his days that like he was shooting or crossover days um, gave me a real sense of what Femi was like when he was young. Cause 
Uh, I know how, like Shola had explained to me how he was working with uh, the younger members of the cast. I, I don't know if you want to talk, touch on that later, Shola, but like um, they didn't really get to see a script. And so knowing that and, and knowing that Shola's really just trying to pull from, from who they are, meant I could like really just like kind of just observe Ty and use that to create part of Femi as well. So um, yeah, one thing that I got from him is that he was really grounded um, and really like quite hyper aware. Um, and there's there's some conversations that I had with him, some conversations that he had with um, with Shola that Shola had shared with me from like when he'd auditioned. And I was just like, you know, this for, I think he was 11 at the time or 12, you know, for a 12 year old kid, like you have a lot of knowledge and a really interesting perspective. And so uh, that's kind of what I took uh, as a as a kind of basis for, for a younger Femi. And then, um, and then obviously uh, Femi had also gone through that experience of being fostered. And uh, I personally don't know what it's like, but I know people that have been fostered. Um, I know people that went through that uh, experience, um, you know, older people, people my age, and so I was able to kind of like observe them. And I knew, I knew actually one person that I felt had had like a very similar story to, to Femi. And I'd known that person for a while, but I didn't realize that that person had also been fostered until much, much later into our relationship. And it kind of helped me to fill in the gaps in some of uh, that person's behaviors and stuff. And so, um, that was also kind of used to to create the character um but mostly like, everything was kind of like on the page uh you just for me i just felt like i was just like i was just allowing the character to just like live live through me like every everything that he was everything that he experienced of course there were things that i could personally connect to and stuff but like, a lot of it was on the page and a lot of it was just about it's just about tuning into what it feels like to to be like abandoned or to feel unloved or to have all of this angst and like what you actually do with it and i think that's something that we've all experienced and those are emotions that we've all experienced and so yeah i was just i was just able to tap into that i guess mm, thank you sam um we have another question from Ngo, um who asks question to all three has the film um changed and impacted your own identity or how you view identity as a person or perhaps influenced your perspective of life and relationships and we'll start with shola <laughs> Sam and Rusha are happy about that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think it's, um, I think it, yes, it kind of like, yes, it has to in a way. Um, just because you, from my perspective, you spend so much time meditating on it. And so you, you, you constantly engage in that conversation about identity and the fluidity of it all. Um, and, and for me, just personally looking back at certain elements of my own upbringing and how much how, how much certain elements have informed who I am today and my evolution as just as an individual um, I think it's it's, it's it's a constant conversation I don't think there's ever a full stop on that conversation mm -hmm. I think it's constantly evolving I'm always my theory is like you kind of you, you know we all celebrate one birthday but we have multiple birthdays in our lifetime because we're always evolving so that our lifespan every seven years we're changing or even more frequently than that but i feel like there's there's multiple birthdays in one's lifespan and we're constantly growing and evolving and so each time my thoughts and feelings about identity change or i can affirm certain ideas here but other ideas might fade away and evolve into something else so i think it just really cemented the constant evolution and evolving nature of identity. I love that, the fact that we have many birthdays, we're constantly having birthdays, that's really beautiful. I'm definitely just keeping that one for myself. <laughs> so, Sam? No right requires just a check on the slide check. <laughs> <laughs> um, Sam, what about you? Try to copyright his own quotes, you know. 
thing. I was trying to think. <laughs> oh, that's all good. Um, yeah, uh, for sure. I, I mean, I think Shola put it really, really well and really poetically. Um, but yeah, it definitely, it definitely changed. It definitely changed. It made me a lot more aware about myself and my own like relationships and spaces in my life where I feel like I've been wearing a mask, you know, mm-hmm. and being able to observe that in others as well. Like, yeah, it, I mean, yeah, for sure. I, I mean, that's that's just in the, in terms of playing the character and I guess watching the film back as well. But like, again, like the whole experience was quite transformative for me. Um, I hadn't, I hadn't, you know, sim- similar to, to Femi, I, I'm Nigerian, but I've, I'd never been to Nigeria. Do you know what I mean? I'm British, you know, I was born here, raised here, but I'd never been to Nigeria. So when we went back and we were shooting in Lagos, that was my first time in Lagos, you know, and that as an experience, like it shifts you, you know, like you actually, it's interesting, we're shooting a film called The Last Tree, people want to know what it's about. Like, I felt like that was the first time for me where I felt truly connected to my roots because I was laying my feet on on that foundation. Do you know what I mean? So, um, yeah, super transformative. Oh, B, you all right? Yeah, yeah cool. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Super transformative uh, experience. And uh, yeah, I mean, we're always we're always growing. So I hope like I hope I'm always transforming and, and uh, making things. Yeah, yeah. I really like what you said about that transformation, and also it made me aware of the fact that physically you were so different I remember when I I, I first met you and I was like oh okay because you were buff you were buff in that like you've been working out a lot um did you do that specifically don't gas me don't gas me don't gas me so was that specifically for Femi or was that the period of um you know there was that just something within your life at that time um, I don't know. I mean, these guys, these, I mean, Shola saw, saw my self tapes. Um, I don't know if I was that size, but like they hired me anyway. Do you know what I mean? So I, don't know, I just, I just tried to utilize it, I suppose. Um, I think there was like a montage scene. I think, you know, someone, someone like Femi, or my idea of him is, you know, if he's, if he's on road, like he, he probably knows how to take care of himself, you know, and you know, we weren't, yeah. So yeah, it, it was something that I tried to incorporate into the character because um, I'm not too sure how convincing I was as a 16 year old at the time, because I was not 16. Um, so yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah, you just you just have to try and incorporate it at the end of the day. Um, and that's just where I was like physically. But at the same time, I was also going to the gym whilst we were shooting, because I just, I don't know, for me, it helps also like with my mental, but yeah, it also helped with the character a lot, so. Yeah, yeah, I guess. Good to know. And Ruth, what about you? Um, so how has the film changed, impacted your identity or perception of identity and maybe influenced your perception of life and relationships? That's a big question. Sorry, I'm deep in it as I'm going on. Um, yeah, it, it, do you know, I had that moment of, I can't believe I ever felt like that about myself. You know what I mean? Like I couldn't imagine looking at my skin any differently now. For this is me relating it to Tope and going through her journey and trying to figure it out. And I kept having those moments of because she was very, you know, she she sheltered herself, she was quite quiet, whereas I was more brass and you know, open about things and I'd say if I felt a certain way. So it was hard enough bringing um having like the bullying scenes and having to like tap into Tope's like, okay, I'm gonna shy away or I'm gonna hold my anger and not bring it out. Um, whereas if those situations happened to me at that age, I probably would have been louder and I would have been, in a sense of this, reflecting outwards. Um, so what I'm saying is I learned that I, it's just, it's sad that it took, it would take so many years for, for me at that time to accept myself or accept the like culture and so on and understand who I am. Whereas I feel like at an older age, maybe there's more girls now that, they're able to get to that place much faster for the developments that happen in the world and for whatever reasons, social reasons. Um, yeah, apart from that with relationships and stuff, it's just understanding people. I think it's the same, growing and coming from a place of love, coming from a place of good intention. Um, seeing how 
not getting to know someone, understanding where someone comes from can be the smallest change in your relationship or how you continue to then treat other people. Um, yeah, I think it was just focused in that space because of what Tofe went through and then the other characters as well and how they treat Sam is just, it's that, I have that sliding doors mirror theory in my head where the littlest change or the little thing you can say to someone, dude, someone could change the whole aspect of their life and just continuing that and continuing yeah, that. And yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm going to ask two more questions because we are soon out of time. It's almost been an hour, guys. Um, we have to talk about, I think, um, location as character. And as a poet, I love the fact that the alliteration of London and Lincolnshire and Lagos. So, Shola, talk to us um, about what it was like shooting in, in those locations and, yeah, location as a character. Uh, it's a big, it's a big uh, part of my interest. Like, I get so much energy from location. You know, my film, the film I made prior to this was about Brixton and, and it was set entirely in Brixton. And, and, so, and we drew so much energy from the space to tell, that, to have that conversation about justification. And so with the last tree, um, I think, um, we, you know, we always, we kind of had this thing we were looking at, like an odyssey, like a modern odyssey across like time and space and landscapes. And you couldn't get more extreme landscapes than Lincolnshire, South London and Lagos. They're just completely different. And, um, you know, having a character travel through those uh, environments and seeing what effect those environments have on the character and vice versa. Um, is it was super important to the to the thesis of the last tree, and so um, yeah, Lincolnshire. Me and Still had a field day, really mapping out aesthetic choices and, and how to render each space in relationship to Femi and his perception of each space, or his feelings and his mood and his tone, his emotion in each space. Um, and um, so we could actually build on those stark differences and compound on those. And, and make them even starker if we need them to be, if we needed them to be, and and, and smoother if they if they needed to be. I, th I think um, Lincolnshire and South London super stark contrasts, but I think what's interesting is when you get to Lagos, you kind of, particularly in those final scenes on the beach, you kind of get a coalescence of the two in the weirdest way. Um, and I, so I think there's a kind of um, a book ending uh, in that final scene that. Um, Essentially, where you see younger Femi running and playing in Lincolnshire is, is a place called the Wash, which is essentially the sea, just at low tide. So at a uh, different time of day or different day, there'd be war in, all in that place. And then where we end up in Lagos is obviously at the beach right next to the water, so to the sea, the ocean. So, yeah, we, we really, you know, the last tree really is uh, an exemplary example of location as character. Thank you. And to Sam and Ruth, um, and, and you too, Shola, but um, Sam, you go first. Um, I'm sure everyone's really curious about what you've been up to since The Last Tree and what your next projects, uh, what's coming up for you. Um, I always, I always say this, like, even, even when I'm not like working on anything in particular, um, I'm always working on myself. And I think that's like a really important note for like actors to maintain. Um, to any as actors that are watching it, like I'd, I'd be interested to hear other people's opinions, but like, you know, in this game, we're not always gonna be working and you have to be able to like, you know, still find value in who you are and, and what you do. and because that's that's what you bring to to any character, and that's that's the light that sparks you up in a room. Do you know what I mean? So I'm always working on myself. Um, so that's a continuous project. Um, but in terms of like tangible stuff, I'm grateful. I just finished shooting um, a TV series for BBC America called The Watch. Um, uh, the COVID situation kind of paused uh, um, the production um, for a little while. Um, but yeah, I'd, I'd finish shooting my stuff. So um, yeah, I guess look forward to seeing that at some point later in the year when we're able to start like doing stuff again. Um, 
yeah and yeah that's that's my that's my bit of news I guess mm, nice and I love the yourself as a project that's also a copyrightable quotable <laughs> so thanks for that Sam Ruth what have you been up to what's next yeah similar to what Sam said in between jobs it's a lot of work on yourself trying to keep busy trying to keep yourself in the act like I do this thing where I'm thinking um, like everyone can kind of do homework when they leave their work when like actors homework is still the fun bit of homework when you get to watch movies and go to the theater a lot of that's been stopped because of covid so it's more so yeah working yourself trying to keep sane during this time um but since the project i've recently been on a webisode series called exposed with the films um and just waiting to see i think it's doing production right now editing but yeah working on myself, hitting self-tapes and just continuing that lifestyle. And yeah, that's about it right now. Oh, just yeah. wait and see what happens, see what happens. Yeah. yeah, looking forward to seeing it. And last but not least, Chola, what's next for you? What are you up to? Yeah, I've just been developing a couple of film and TV projects. Um, but the thing I've, I've made that I'm most recently proud of is a VR experience called Violence, which, which had its premiere at Cannes XR this week. So uh, it's an immersive film, so it's VR. Um, and it's kind of hard to uh, access, but I think it's, uh, you go to the Cannes XR website, there's a whole spiel about how you access it, but we're working on uh, 360 video versions of it as well to share with um, everyone. Um, but yeah, just developing a few things. Oh, amazing, guys. We are at the end of our time, but real tears. It's been such a pleasure talking to all three of you. Thank you so much, Ruth. Thank Great. you so Thank much, you. Thank, you, Thank you so much, Thank you. Gang, gang. See you later. <laughs> yeah, gang, gang. It's been absolutely great. And I need to say... <laughs> Thank you to um, Picture House Live and Picture House Entertainment, especially Laura Jacobs, who's oh. made sure everything has run smoothly tonight. Um, Shout out to Laura Jacobs. Shout out yeah. to Picture House. <laughs> <laughs> in this online experience, as I said earlier, the film is on BFI Player. You can view it now. You can also buy it on DVD and Blu-ray. It's on Amazon and iTunes. It's really important, guys. If you've seen the film and you love it like we do, make sure that you spread the word and you keep talking about it. This is how we change cinema. This is part of our activism. So tweet and twat and all that Gucci stuff and keep talking about it. And please follow, follow Shola and Sam and Ruth on their socials. I'm B Manzini. Thank you for having us. Uh, stay inspired, stay safe, be well. Bye, everyone. <laughs>